can a herniated disc heal on its own? I'm Anthony Gosh, consultant spinal neurosurgeon and founder of the Spine MDT, and this is a very common question I get asked. Well, the short answer is yes, but watch this video. I'm going to explain the mechanisms, how likely and when it's likely to happen, and also when you need to seek help. And in previous videos, I've talked about herniated discs, uh, treatments for it, and even surgery for it. But today, let's focus on discs that heal on their own. Once again, we're going to go into the anatomy to try and understand it. So this is a picture of the spinal column here from the head right down to the pelvis. If we zoom in, we can see that it's made up of vertebral bodies, which are these cylindrical blocks of bone stacked on top of each other and an arch of bone at the back of each. So when you do stack them on top of each other, you form a tunnel down the middle called the spinal canal. Between each bone, the discs are actually these cushions that are between the bodies, between the bodies of the bone. And let's focus in on this picture here. So um, a, a disc is like a piece of crab meat. That's actually how a lot of textbooks describe them. It's that sort of consistency, that squishy material. And you've got that kind of substance here in the middle that we call the nucleus. And then it's surrounded by this fibrous stuff called the annulus around it. And what happens over time with wear and tear, the annulus, the lining, that fibrous stuff starts to tear, wear down a bit, and then a bit of the nucleus here starts to herniate, break away and herniate through it. At the time of rupture of this uh, back part of the annulus, the lining, there's an inflammatory response that generates pain in the area. So you can get acute back pain from that time of rupture and some of the material and liquid herniating out. If it pinches a nerve, it can send pain down the leg, and that's what sciatica is. So you trap a nerve here, that nerve usually innervates a muscle, as it's coming from the lumbar spine, it innervates a muscle uh, in your leg and also gives sensation to the skin in the leg, so you can get pain and tingling and numbness uh, down the leg. Quite often, though, that's not the case. Quite often, you get the herniation and the acute tear. Patients have acute pain in the back, um, which can which can resolve over time. So let's talk about that. Numerous papers in the medical literature suggest that anything from 30 up to 90% of these discs or pain from a disc um, usually settles down within a period of around six weeks or so. The average in, in the majority, in the biggest literature reviews that I've looked at is around 60% of patients will, will resolve or, or improve at around six weeks. And here are some of the mechanisms proposed. One is just purely disc reabsorption, i.e. the disc material um, coming back into the spine. Uh, another mechanism is when the disc material comes out, a lot of the fluid that's in this disc space, a lot of water content here, leaks out, it dehydrates and therefore it shrinks with time. And then the third mechanism, which is probably the one that's accepted the most or the most common is that when the disc, when the disc herniates into this space here around the nerves known as the epidural space, there's an inflammatory response that takes place uh, with vessels building up in the area, veins dilating and things like that. And then that just reabsorbs and breaks down a lot of the disc material, an inflammatory response that your body just gener uh, generates and breaks down dissolving that disc. Let's look at these mechanisms one by one. The first is disc retraction, so the disc coming back into the disc. On this channel, I recently had a discussion with Professor Stuart McGill, famously known as the back mechanic. Um, he's a kinesiologist who's done extensive research on the biomechanics of the spine, and his research has shown that if the height of the disc when a herniation happen, happens is, has lost height of more than 10% or so, then that retraction is less likely to happen. So a lot of, quite often we notice with patients who have acute back pain that's come on from a torn disc, if they tend to feel better when walking around, if you feel the pain improves a bit when you get up and walk around on slightly uneven ground, that's, put, that's usually a sign of the disc being the generator of the pain. And if it improves, that usually means you've lost less than 10% of the height here from the disc herniation. And it's probably in those patients where you're more likely to get better from certain manipulations of the spine uh, to help itself resolve. Then there's shrinkage by dehydration. So a lot of the nucleus content here is water. As this tears, the water leaks out and overall it shrinks. And then it does actually start to break down um, and scar over with time, creating space around nerves and less inflammation. Often that's the case when the disc has recently been quite healthy and well hydrated. As it, as it herniates out, 
a lot of volume is lost from that water loss. Um, but then we're going to go into the third mechanism now where we create an inflammatory response from this disc and then the body just breaks it down and just reabsorb it systemically rather than it coming back into um, the body itself. Um, and that's probably the most commonest cause. Studies have been done to try and predict what types of disc are going to resolve based on their consistency. And they found that a disc herniation that's fairly fresh, i.e. a healthy disc with a nucleus that herniates out uh, through the tear and it's, um, you know, fresh hydrated, well hydrated ones are the ones that are more likely to resolve rather than patients who have perhaps had chronic dehydration of the disc where they appear very black on the MRI scan quite consistently and that just herniated over time. The former, the fresh, the fresh disc is the one that's more likely to heal up with time. And that's interesting because what that also means and what's also been shown is that the size of the disc bulge doesn't always represent one that's not going to go away. In fact, there's some suggestion that the bigger the herniation, the more active the response is and therefore the more likely it is to resolve. But now I want to go into what therefore do you need to look out for and when do you need to seek help? So let's just go back to anatomy. I just want to uh, help you understand this a little bit more. This picture up here, if I didn't mention it earlier, this is a cross section of the spine. So if I slice you across the waist or across this column and look up from the feet, uh, this is the back here, the arch of the spine at the back and the disc and bone material at the front. And this here, under the arch of bone at the back, this here is the spinal canal, the tunnel that the spinal cord and all the nerves run through. If this massive disc herniation takes up all of this volume here and starts to crush all of the nerves in that area, that can lead to a problem known as corda equina syndrome, um, which is bilateral leg pain, saddle numbness and uh, urinary retention or even uh, incontinence. And that's an emergency that one, if you develop those three symptoms, uh, that's an emergency and you need immediate decompression of those nerves to protect them and protect your neurological function. Um, so that's that's the scenario where I would intervene surgically or invasively within that six week time frame that most people um, improve on. If it pinches a nerve and you get sciatica with the um, with the disc herniation, as long as you've got motor function, i.e. no weakness of of that leg, I wouldn't necessarily dive in and operate on it, as the chances are it still will resolve with conservative measures. The exception is when if it's trapping a single nerve and you start to get weakness of the leg or the ankle or floppiness of the foot, then the evidence suggests the earlier the surgery or the decompression, the more likely you are uh, to regain that function. So in the first few weeks, if you do not have motor deficit, um, then it's unlikely you're going to have anything invasive done unless the pain is quite severe. Usually the most invasive thing I do um, early would be an injection just to allow some of that inflammation to resolve and help with the pain. And that can be quite effective. Otherwise, if the pain's gone on beyond uh, six weeks and you're not improving, that's another indication to consider something invasive, although that's not a must. Often some manipulations um, can help to retract the disc back in when it is quite loose, but this should be done with caution with someone quite experienced at it to avoid worsening that herniation. If you're concerned about your spine, you can visit our website and try out our spinal assessment tool. Most patients I see are actually treated non-invasively by some of our partners, physiotherapists, chiropractors, or osteopaths as part of a program. But the unique thing is it's under my oversight or the oversight of a surgeon. So you can inquire about our packages of care. Please subscribe to the channel if you found this video helpful. You can also click the like button. It really helps patients suffering with spine disease uh, find information that I try and post on this channel on a weekly basis.